Joining us now is Guard Goldsmith. Always great to talk to Guard. And uh, Guard has uh, done guest hosting for us many times. Uh, he is uh, uh, very well read, uh, very well informed, and uh, focused on liberty and many other things. And he is one of the hardest working, busiest people in media. Uh, he has Gardner Goldsmith at Substack, uh, gardnergoldsmith.substack.com. It's where you can find articles that he's doing. Uh, thank you for joining us, Gard. Are, are there also your videos, are they embedded in the articles there at Substack? Uh, yeah, in fact, at Substack, um, I don't have the videos embedded in the articles, but now Substack is allowing people to post videos, and I'm going to start looking into linking up two videos that I might put out uh, via MRC TV. So right now we have MRC TV. They put out my videos. I also have Liberty Conspiracy on BitChute and Odyssey and Rumble. And when I'm posting as BitChute videos, Substack is now letting us put out videos. So um, oh, they're on their own now. But yeah, that embedded idea is a great idea. I'm going to look into that, David. I hadn't hadn't even really thought about that. Yeah, I haven't done that. With, I've only put out a couple of articles on Substack so far. I just got on like a week or two ago. And uh, yeah. put another one out this weekend, but um, uh, I'll have to look at that too and see if I can embed stuff with it. But uh, let, let's talk about some of the articles you got. You you talked about what's happening with the Italian elections. There's a lot of things that we can glean from that. What what did you see out of that that you thought was interesting? Well, you know, I have to say, um, I, I came at it um, uh, obviously with a, a bit of skepticism, I and mean, we were talking about Italy, where what they might measure as freedom based on how far afield they went with the lockdowns and how bad their economy is, mm -hmm. uh, could be, uh, could be seen as, as something completely different for a libertarian like me. Uh, and, but, and they were uh, the first ones to jump into that. As a matter of fact, you know, they yeah. were hectored by a, a massive army of bots from China to do exactly that. And, and so they've been blown around by every wind of change coming from the globalists. They've had Mario Drago, you know, put in a central banker, put in their technocrats re removing elected officials. And they all bowed to that except for her. And that is a big one of the reasons that she was so popular. Yeah, yeah. And and you can see, you know, I, I think it translates to the spirit of the times for people who are sensible people who um, uh, don't get drawn into a lot of the uh, the rhetoric and, and the media hype. And uh, especially coming from Italy, which, as as you noted, uh, it was only in the 1800s that Italy became a nation state. Right. Uh, prior to that, it was the, the small city state concept in the provincial areas. So I think they they still seem to have some sort of uh, vestigial connections <laughs> to smaller spheres of control, and I think um, Ms. Uh, Maloney's candidacy really reflected that. Now, you know, I, I I don't necessarily agree with her on on certain issues, but if you look at the way that the the internationalists attacked her with the EU's van der Leyen uh, going after her and saying <laughs> that they would essentially pull the same things that they did trying to change Hungary. And we've already seen yeah. how the e European Central Bank uh, replaced the leadership of Greece and they put in Draghi uh, a, a couple of years ago. That's right. So we can see how these forces of the local decentralized, you know, nativist type of populace like her uh, really are uh, stirring people up. And that speech that she offered uh, yesterday was amazing. I think she might have seen the prisoner. I, yeah. I have a feeling. <laughs> so, yeah, she mentions I'm not a number. As a matter of fact, let's play this, and it's in Italian, but I'll read the uh, subtitles here for it, and let's talk about that when we come back here, a guard. But but here's the you speech bet. that everybody is talking about, and you can see it on social media as well. But I want to play it for you, and, and I'll read the subtitles. Uh, this is about what we're doing here today. Why is the family an enemy? Why is the family so frightening? There's a single answer to all these questions. Because it defines us. Because it is our identity. Because everything that defines us is now an enemy. For those who would like us to no longer have an identity, simply be perfect and consumer slaves. And so they attack national identity. They attack religious identity. They attack gender identity. They attack family identity. I can't define myself as an Italian Christian woman, mother. No. I must be citizen X, gender X, parent one, parent two. I must be a number. <laughs> because when I'm only a number, when I no longer have an identity or roots, then I will be the perfect slave at the mercy 
a financial speculator, the perfect consumer. Oh, that was good. That was good. Yeah, she has a, <laughs> I'm not a number. <laughs> I'm a free Christian mother with a family. That's what she's saying there, Gart. Absolutely. And, you know, uh, watching your program, David, and seeing the signals uh, that were coming out of Italy. And then I, I remember uh, Chris Tomlinson reported for Breitbart, reported about how uh, von der Leyen had been uh, warning uh, the Italians, essentially prior to the election. Uh, and, of course, setting it up that... Uh, threatening them. What's that? Threat, not warning, yeah, but threatening, threatening them. them. And Literally. even the left-wing commies said, uh, hey, you, you can't interfere with our election that way. They realized how damaging that was going to be to them. Uh, exactly you know, for her to do that so yeah yeah and she was in the united states i didn't i don't remember hearing anything about uh, about this from joe biden who's you know all about autonomy and wants ukraine to be so free that he's going to pick my pocket and yours to yeah. send weapons there and use them as uh, cannon fodder you yeah, know that's right um it, it blew my mind and and the it, it, in microcosm in a very short period i think we've seen how uh, the pop media attempt to portray um, Ms. Uh, Maloney uh, as, or Mrs. Maloney as a um, as a fascist mm -hmm. is uh, it's it's just it's it's a it's a great little example. It's a lesson to to see how their rhetoric doesn't stick. Um, right. And uh, you know, you went through it very well when she was a teenager. She mentioned Mussolini. Um, the the party or this coalition that they've made, the, the Brothers of Italy, uh, has some background that seems to have, in tangential ways, they think members of it might have come from a pro Mussolini side. But they don't. The people who are calling her neo fascist don't even understand what fascism is. That's right. They don't even get it. And this is, as I mentioned in the video that I made for it, this is Italy. The home of fascism. This is where <laughs> fascism started. If you're going to be reporting on fascism in Italy, you'd think you would understand what it is, but That's they right. don't. All it is is what we got in high school when we were kids, which is it's bad to dislike other people. Well, if in, in that case, then you can't discern about actions. Uh, I, I dislike people who are criminally minded and want to harm other people. Is that all right? There That's are right. reasons that we dislike people and we hope that they will change. And um, one of the reasons that I dislike people is when they misinterpret people or they, they mischaracterize people simply because those people believe in Christianity or the family or smaller decentralized government. And that was what everybody was criticizing her for. As I pointed out, I had to look long and hard to find anybody that had anything that was truly uh, could be, uh, you know, construed as fascist. The comments that she made when she was 19 and she's now, you know, 30 years later. Uh, but, uh, and it wasn't, uh, you know, it was a, a passing remark, just a compliment to Mussolini or whatever. Uh, and not that I'm, you know, making light of that, but nevertheless, what they really had a problem with her. Uh, everybody was calling her a fascist simply because uh, she was religious, Christian, because she was a mother, because she supported family, because she was a nationalist. All of these things got her the label of extreme right wing. And of course, they never talk about anybody being extreme left wing. You had center left, and then you had the people who were extreme right fascist. And that's where they put her because she was about God, family, and country. And, um, yeah. and that was really the issue that they had with her. And that's why I talked about it. I said, look at the way the press is putting this. And of course it truly is an attack on the family, uh, because, uh, that's what the EU has a problem with Hungary and Poland about, uh, the fact that they're standing up for the family in uh, contrast to the LGBT, uh, push towards children and their their antipathy towards the family. That's what the EU was doing to punish Hungary and Poland. So it truly is about the family. She's absolutely, everybody understands that. Yeah, and let's hope that, you know, because they're part of this this crown of the EU, and I use crown in a, in a, a, uh, in, in a, in a cultic sort of way here, um, uh, referencing uh, perhaps biblical prophecy, I don't know, but uh, because Italy is part of the e EU and the European Central Banking Community, uh, they think that they can lever, lever the pressure on Italy the way that they have tried to do it with Hungary, because of course, Hungary, in Hungary, they weren't going to disconnect from Russian energy, um, and Poland, they weren't going to do it, but 
Hungary and Poland, they they kowtowed the, in certain ways. And um, so what I think is is quite interesting is uh, the areas where I might disagree with her um, and uh, how I think those are little warnings to people. And I'll give you an example, David, you know, um, one of her proposals and, and they aren't they aren't there. I think they're blown up in many ways by many of the left wingers uh, when she they say, well, she opposes gay marriage. Yeah, but she's in favor of civil unions. Mm-hmm. She just doesn't want to use the biblical term marriage for something that is a sin. That's you right. know, she yeah. th- that's different. Uh, when it comes to heading up the state, I mean, as you know, I'm a Christian anarchist. I don't want any state. But when it comes to heading up the state, you can understand how homosexual people, if they see that married people are getting certain um, favors from the state, like the state forcing access for hospital visits Mm -hmm. or um, easier, yeah, easier accommodation of wills, then homosexual people might say, well, we want that sort of legal protection as well. You're handing something to the married people. But what gets me is, when you get conservative people, and I think this is just, a, it's a, just a tiny warning, but I think it's a large warning for Americans. Uh, and it translates to something I heard earlier today, and I want to explore it a little more. Um, uh, you know, she has this proposal to actually subsidize having children, which is actually something they've already tried in Italy years ago. They were going to try to do that because yeah. population was going down. Uh, and uh, I think it's in Sardinia. Uh, they want to pay people to move there. I think it's like 15,000 euros to move to Sardinia um, and uh, or Sardinia. So um, what's fascinating to me is that, you know, some of these folks, they see the bad things that the state has done to erode families, to erode traditionalism and things like that. And then they want to overcompensate by using the state yeah, exactly. to try to promote it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, this morning I was listening to a radio program out of Boston, terrific radio host. He's really good. And, um, and he was talking about crime outside of uh, Pennsylvania, outside of Philadelphia um, um, these just dozens and dozens of looters went into a store and just blew it out. They took everything and people were just standing there stunned. They didn't want to react. They didn't want to get involved. They didn't want to get confused with the looters if the police arrived. Mm-hmm. So there's this weird, you know, cognitive strategy going on. And, uh, it made me think a little bit about how conservatives oftentimes, and sometimes libertarians as well, they'll have this cognitive dissonance where, uh, this, host has in the past said we've got to watch out for the federalization of police (laughs) just this morning he's saying where is joe biden offering help for police it's like no no don't do this i know kevin mccarthy is talking about how they want two hundred thousand police and i said you know they're gonna they're gonna give them the money they're gonna let them get used to it and then the strings are gonna come and the strings will probably get put on and start they start pulling them once the democrats get in power uh, that's the way this yeah. thing always works you don't want to federalize yeah. the police and and you're absolutely right uh you know we don't want to make the mistake of having um the government uh get involved with a family any more than we want to have the government involved with churches they ruin everything that they get involved with. They take over everything they get involved with. They corrupt yeah. everything they get involved with. So I don't want them near uh, churches. I don't want them near family. <laughs> I don't want them near education. A lot of homeschoolers will say, hey, you know, where's my government subsidy? I, I should be getting some uh, help from the government. It's like, you don't want the help from the government. Don't take that money. Uh, you know, don't, uh, don't, that's a trap. <laughs> Admiral Akbar, exactly. right? It's a trap. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's a trap. Yeah. It's a trap. Admiral Akbar. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And, and, uh, and this is, this is where, you know, you look at, uh, or I looked at the, the election of Georgia Maloney and I thought, OK, look, in a, in a small area, you can use that that tiny part of this amazing story coming out of Italy and what seems to be a very courageous woman with some very, very strong principles. And, you know, it, you can you can agreeably disagree and you can say, look, you know, I understand the situation you're in, but you're 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 becoming hoist by your own petard here. And this is exactly what I saw this morning with this radio program where you see these people and this, this is where the Mark Houck story comes from. Mm -hmm. You know, we have, this is exactly, we have generation upon generation of political opportunists. The constitution can't stand against that. The constitution itself was brought up by political opportunists in the form of Alexander Hamilton and his buddies. Mm -hmm. It it was, it was considered a usurpation 
by many of the signers of the Declaration of Independence who saw it as a centralizing document. Now, it is much better than what we have now, but but yeah. we can't deny the fact that these political opportunists, generation upon generation, stack upon stack upon stack of attacks. And this is where we get it. You, you mentioned the United States Postal Service story, and that was one that I, I was going to be working on for um, uh, MRC TV today. Um, and, you know, I, thank goodness for, for folks like Reclaim the Net and a Free Thought Project and mm -hmm. Activist Post and, and, and those folks and you, David, amazing work. Um, it, it, the, that itself, the U.S. Postal Service is partially responsible not only for this eavesdropping and all these things, but for the for the TSA. As I mentioned to you, I, I think last time we spoke, the reason the federal government was able to insinuate itself into airports and they would have done it eventually but the excuse that they used was that the constitution grants the federal government the power to create a post office not the exclusive post office just like the money mm -hmm. you know they can create money but not the only money which is a <laughs> point ron paul has brought up over and over again and nobody listens right <laughs> so so back in the 1920s they were starting uh transcontinental air flights and so the federal government got involved through the USPS in banning. They created their own lighted air routes because they didn't have radar and they would fly planes, the Postal Service planes along these routes where they had lights set up so they could do nighttime and they, did, they, could, they could watch for these lights. I don't know if they were every mile or every quarter mile or whatever. And they had giant arrows out on the ground in the desert. And as I mentioned, I think if you're in the Southwest, you can still see some of these giant concrete arrows really pointing for the, yeah, pointing wow. for the pilots to head in that direction because the airport was over in that way. It was, you know, <laughs> that's the way they did it. So from there you get Roosevelt who was a master. And of course we don't hear criticism of the fact that most of Roosevelt's staff adored Stalin. Yeah. So you get criticism of Georgia Maloney because when she was 19, she mentions the the I, I think the nativist tendency to to admire a person like uh, like Mussolini because he mm -hmm. supposedly stood for Italy and and, and their national character. Um, but uh, you don't hear them criticizing FDR and his staff for sundry things like admiring a mass murderer like Stalin. Oh, yeah. you know, that's right. So, so it is amazing. And I think every time one of these little things pops up for me, it's an opportunity to learn something. You know, uh, well, and, that is um, very interesting insight. I didn't know yeah. that about the connection between the post office and the TSA. I didn't know that about the oh, concrete yeah. arrows. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, once once Roosevelt made started. So so what happened was they started the lighted air routes and uh, uh, that was around the 1920s. And they banned private carriers from flying along those routes. And that's how the FAA got set up in starting to control the air routes. And then that became a political gimme a carrot to hand out to various local politicians in places like Chicago. I often mention why in the world would any free market system set up a hub in one of the worst places you could ever fly weather wise throughout <laughs> most of the year, Chicago, <laughs> true, it's yeah. insane, you know, but it's O'Hare airport. And well, that makes sense. Chicago is an incredibly corrupt political city. So mm -hmm. you see these sorts of things and then it becomes a, uh, it becomes a handout system. And that goes all the way back to Alexander Hamilton as I said, and the Whiskey Rebels. You know, the reason they marched on the Whiskey Rebels back in 1790, I think it was, was because they had created the excise tax and they created the tariff under the Constitution, but they forgot to put into it a way to collect the excise tax. <laughs> They so needed 87,000 yeah. IRS agents is what they needed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if only Joe had been there. Yeah. Oh, but maybe he was. He's, he's that ancient. Um, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Uh, so so what happened was, as, as you know, in order to gain political mo momentum and support for changing the Articles of Confederation into something that the Articles were actually not allowed to be changed into, according to the Articles of Confederation, if you were going to amend it, you had to have 100% agreement from all the original states. They changed that to two thirds. And originally they called for an amendment period for the articles. Then they changed it and they said, oh, we're going to have an entirely new government. And it was Hamilton's machinations that brought that about, because as you know, they sold a lot of war bonds during the, during the Revolutionary War. And they, those bonds became essentially worthless. Mm -hmm. So 
Not worth a continent. promised. Yeah, the, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And, and Hamilton knew this and he knew that he could gain support from different uh, different geographical regions and political blocks, especially with the corporatist types out there. If he could get his friends within banking and investing and things like that to buy up these bonds, pennies on the dollar from these poor farmers who had invested in the revolution and knew they weren't going to get paid back. They said, well, we'll pay we'll pay pay it for you. So they gave him a little bit more. And then Hamilton promised that he would pay them 100 percent. And the way that they were going to get that was through the taxing power, which didn't really exist under the articles. The articles, they had to rely on the states to bring the money in to the central government. And they weren't doing it because the states themselves had a lot of debt. And so Hamilton promised these guys this amount of money. And many of them were with the army, with Washington, when they marched, uh, as you know, when they marched on Western Pennsylvania to collect the excise tax from the whiskey. <laughs> so all of this opportunism um, is, you know, that helps pay off the people who invested. That helps change the political sphere from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. And we see the same thing with FDR and airports. Once they set up the airports, the feds are in there. Guess what? You're going to be groped. Yeah. outside of your plane and that, that's and i love the way by the way I've, I've you got me going off i love the way that you mentioned when you go to the airport you make them have to search you i always say to them <laughs> they're like well you're gonna go through the scanner and i always say no you're gonna have to grope me and they hate it when i say that <laughs> that's good <laughs> that's good yeah w what they try to do to us they try to make us stand over by the x-ray machine it's like i'm not gonna yeah. stand here by the x-ray machine uh, I, one of the reasons I'm doing this is I don't want to go through your x-ray machine. So, uh, I'm not going to stand here for the radiation. I don't know how well shielded this thing is. Uh, so yeah. it's always a contentious thing. I, I hate flying. I, I don't like to have, uh, uh, conflicts like that, but it's forced upon me. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm so with you. but you know, that, yeah. that what you're talking about there. And, and it, and, and again, I'll just, uh, point out, as I've talked about it many times, had a, had a guy from new American on, uh, uh, Christian uh, Gomez, I think it was his name. And we talked about the, uh, the danger of a constitutional convention. And of course we've only had one, <laughs> the one that gave yeah. us the constitutional convention and it was a runaway yeah. convention. It ignored all the rules as you pointed out, Gart, uh, to, uh, go from the articles of confederation to the constitution. So we don't want to do that again. Uh, and Gee. you know, we've only had one and, uh, we know how that turned out and they even referenced that one. And so it's like, Absolutely. if you want to completely change your form of government, have a constitutional convention and uh, go for it. You know, that's, that's what it's all about. I wanted to ask you, David, and I was trying to remember because I was looking up uh, different stories. You know, I've got the Substack stuff. I've got the piece that I put out there about the Italian election at Substack. And I have the video over there at Substack. And people can find that. I, I always forget to mention things. If you want to find it, folks, it's Gardner Goldsmith Substack. You know, it's I, I mm -hmm. guess it's the busy, busiest stack on Substack, you might say. I don't know, because there's <laughs> a lot going on. Uh, and then uh, the MRCTV.org folks are great. Uh, they're really terrific. And then MRCTV has their YouTube channel. And then uh, they have a, a Rumble channel as well. And I'm going to start up an entertainment-oriented thing. Because what you said about music, David, I had a conversation with Don Jeffries about this. Um, you know, I write fiction and people can find mm -hmm. my books. I never mention my stuff on Amazon. I have three novels that haven't even been released yet. I declined a contract with one publishing company because they wanted me to separate my political name from my writer's name. They wanted me to write under a pseudonym. And I said, like, why mm. am I going to do that? That's, this is Call just yourself a uh, George Sand or something that that'll go yeah, really yeah, well the yeah. transgender. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, here, I'll, I'll, I'll call myself. I call myself George Miller. There That's you go. What I'll do. By the way, I got this. <laughs> go. I, I got this because of you. Good, yes. good. Thanks to you. That is a his, but, um, his story is a real blessing to. I would recommend that to anybody. So I'm glad you got yeah, that. Yeah. I think you'll be blessed by oh, that. Oh, absolutely. And uh, um, but um, yeah. What I was, what I was. So I'm going to start up an entertainment channel on YouTube as well. Um, but I wanted to ask you, David. You mentioned something talking about uh, constitutional amendments. Was it Oklahoma? Or Indiana last week, you mentioned that they were they were talking about, and I, I really wanted to ask you about this because I've been looking it up as I prepare my stories for MRC TV. I'm going to write about the Postal Service and this invasion of privacy and things like that, and this new information from Ron Wyden. Again, hats mm -hmm. off to him mm -hmm. for doing doing that that aspect of it. I know. Um, yeah, we have to stand with people when they do the right thing. And like I said, yeah. you know, it's like uh, once every three or four years, Ron Wyden does something good. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah exactly. it's really bad. But you know, when he does the right thing, you got to say, "Out of boy," you know. And I, yeah. I feel that way about anybody. And I, you know, if somebody who uh, I typically like their philosophy, if they do the wrong thing, I'll call them out on it. You know, I don't like yeah. doing that, but we have to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, but you mentioned something last week. I think it was David. Uh, was it Oklahoma or Indiana? They were talking about putting a pro-life amendment in their constitution, and the phrasing of it reminded me. And I think I, I was on Rockfin, and I put a comment in, and I think you even mentioned it. I said, "Yeah, it's like Scalia's last lines in the Heller case. They were they were talking about rights, mm -hmm. and they were taking the approach to life where they said the right to life is." you know, is, is untouched. Uh, I don't I recall, can't which I, I want to say Indiana, but I, I don't, I don't recall it that well, but it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, things are changing very rapidly there. And I, I think the biggest story with the abortion stuff is how the Republicans are running away from it now, you know, yeah. so many of them are all going back and scrubbing their website and doing the rest of the stuff because, you know, they could, they could boast about what they were going to do, what they'd like to do and what they think about, you know, uh, life and liberty and all that kind of stuff. But now, uh, the ball is in their court and, uh, it's a, you know, it, it, it's a hot potato. They don't want to have anything to do with it. And, uh, and it's why they never did anything all this time. Like I said, for the longest time, we've known that, uh, that Roe v. Wade was a usurpation of the, uh, 10th amendment. And the appropriate response to Roe v. Wade would have been for Texas to say, well, you've issued your opinion. Let's see you enforce it. You know, they should have nullified exactly. it. And because they didn't nullify it, you had, what, 63 million babies die over the last uh, 50 years or so. And now the Supreme yeah. Court has, uh, with this Dobbs decision, has said what I've been saying all these years. Yeah, it's not a federal issue. Uh, this is something to be decided in the states. Uh, I think that's yeah. the, the key thing is that we need to understand that, um, you know, we don't want to. And, and I think it's a mistake to do the kinds of stuff that Lindsey Graham is trying to do to say, we're going to federalize it again. Uh, if you federalize it again, you're going to wind up, uh, you know, it's going to be back and forth and you're going to have a situation where it's universally uh, it, 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 uh, allowed to kill children. We have to uh, take this into our, take the responsibility into each and every state to protect life. We want to have that ability to do that and not have that taken away from us by the federal government. And uh, then we have to understand that ultimately, uh, you're not going to stop abortions by prohibitions. You're going to stop it by reforming the people from the inside out. And that's really what right. needs to be amended instead of any constitutions. Uh, you need to amend yeah. the people. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, and uh, David, I always find it an interesting uh, mental exercise to encounter people who are, are left wing. And I'll, I'll do a couple things to them uh, or with them. Uh, or at least, you know, play with them mentally sometimes <laughs> and see, see how they respond. You know, uh, maybe we'll have some fun and, and, uh, I don't know. Uh, but, uh, when we talk about the life issue, uh, we talk about, uh, things like, uh, ninth and 10th amendments, very clear, uh, the right to life. I, I'll ask them, I'll say, look, um, do you, the problem that I find with many leftists is that they are so inconsistent. Uh, that uh, it seems like it's just matters of convenience and their their memories just wash away very, very quickly. And this, this can happen pragmatism. in sometimes. It's pragmatism, yes, pragmatism, what they want, you know, because it, it yeah. is difficult to say that there is an overruling set of principles that I'm going to be guided by. And they reject that exactly. fundamentally because the left has embraced postmodernism. So they don't believe that there is yeah. even any absolute truth. So why would we pay attention to what... Uh, the Constitution says, or what the Bible says, it's just, you know, what I feel is true is true. I've got a truth, you've got a truth, we've all got a truth, but I've got one truth, and that is that there is no truth. Yeah, and I, I love, <laughs> you know, it's the simplest syllogism when they when they say, well, look, you know, there is no absolute truth, and you say, is that absolutely true? <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's Are you arguing for truth? Because if you're arguing yeah. for truth, then you must think there is a truth. Uh, you know, it's it's so simple. And that, that of course, if you take that back and logically extrapolate that, then that leads you to a one creator, an intelligent creator. And then you look into the history of Christ and you look into the, um, the Old Testament and you realize it's Christ, mm -hmm. it's God, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but uh, I, always, I always ask them, I say, look, I'll say, and to the left wingers, like I'll say, look, do you support? Um, um, it's the same sort of argument that people you can use against uh, people who who want to uh, use the police to so-called ban guns. Say, mm -hmm. do you support making sure that a person um, who uh, 
uh, rapes a woman or, or, or shoots a 17 year old working behind the counter of a 7-Eleven, that, that there's police protection, that police, that the judicial system should, what is the reason that the police are there? Why, why do they exist? Well, to protect my life. Okay, then you have to ask them, if you believe that, then please wrestle with what is a human life. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I got this from, it was Kathy Ireland was on uh, years ago, was on uh, Bill Maher's original ABC, Politically Incorrect. Hmm. And she's pr- Christian pro-life. And she said, is it human? Yes, it is distinctly human. The fetus upon creation, upon conception is distinctly human with its own DNA. Even if you want to remove God from it, mm-hmm. if you just want to be completely secular, you want to be, you know, independent of any religious beliefs. And is it being? Well, what else is it? Mm-hmm. You can't, it? That's what it is. It is on that great arc from beginning to end. And that is life. And so, therefore, you say, okay, if you believe that statutes, that the state exists in order to protect people from encroachments on their life and property by others, then where do you draw the line? Now, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution which they often will cite about equal treatment, which is not really the wording of the 14th Amendment. It's equal protection under the law. So all these handouts from government, this shows you how far Americans have come from the concept, the original Lockean concept that government is created to protect people from other people Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the idea that government is created to hand us stuff. Because people look at the 14th Amendment as saying, equal treatment under the law. So if the government hands out this to this group, it has to hand out this to that group and this to that group. But that's not what the 14th Amendment is. It's equal protection under the law because, of course, they were looking at things like lynchings. People weren't being prosecuted in the 1870s. So they said, okay, we're going to make sure that states prosecute equally. So if you're going to prosecute somebody for murder uh, of a human being, which human beings are the leftists going to choose? Yeah. Yeah. And exactly. that's the problem. It's their inconsistency. Yeah. And, and they don't like that. They hate hearing that. They really don't like hearing that because. Well, you know, it's also yeah. when you talk about that, you know, in terms of uh, protecting people, what, what are you protecting them from? Typically from government, you know, as you said, people say, uh, well, government is here to give us stuff, you know, and to give it to mm-hmm. us equally. Uh, yeah. and, and that is, uh, you know, what the left has tried to do. And again, they manipulate language. And so you had uh, Barack Obama himself was talking about, uh, but it's, he didn't come up with these terms, but it, this, these are typical leftist terms to talk about positive rights or negative rights. And so a positive right says you, you got a right to uh, this and you got a right to that. And it's going to be coming from the government. Right. And he says, so I like positive rights. I, I don't like negative rights because what are negative rights? Well, that's saying the government won't do this and the government won't do that. Uh, the understanding of the people who founded this country was that government is very dangerous. Uh, it's not comprised of, ang- uh, of angels. And so we need to keep it under control. And so the, the Bill of Rights is a list of prohibitions on government. And the liberals don't like that. They like to have a list of things that you're going to get from government. The people, the leftist people, uh, think that they're going to get stuff from government that's there to give them handouts. But the people who actually run the government. Uh, they believe that the purpose of government is to protect and aggrandize the government. It's a continuity yeah. of government and to make sure that government is always in control of everything, that government gets more power and no restrictions on government. That's their perspective. Their perspective is everything for the government, whereas these other people have been conned into thinking that the government is there as some kind of a big Santa Claus. I remember years ago, P.J. Rourke at uh, Rolling Stone said, uh, the Democrats think that government is Santa Claus and the Republicans think government is God. <laughs> <laughs> he says, the, 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 first of all, the problem is that there is no Santa Claus, <laughs> but, but he said, we have to be careful about making government God, you know? And, and I think he was, he was spot on when he, when he talked about that. He, he lived just a few towns away from me in New Did Hampshire he? for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. So rest in peace, PJ O'Rourke. Yeah. And you know, there are a couple of things that run parallel here, David, that, uh, you remind me, uh, you remind me of these things. Um, first off, you know, it, it makes me think about that whole idea, that canard that they give us, especially around July 4th, about self-governance. 
And and uh, Biden mentions this. Almost every president does this. They say this experiment in self government. <laughs> so you know they're they're blurring the lines between national independence from Great Britain mm-hmm. and calling that self governance. Mm-hmm. That's not self governance. That's right. And this is one of the problems. Yeah, this is one of the problems that I have as a, as a libertarian anarchist, a Christian anarchist. This is one of the problems that I have with people who think that John Locke. Just to get philosophical for a second, people would think that John Locke is a natural rights philosopher. He's not. John Locke is a social contract philosopher hiding within the guise of a natural rights philosopher. And you nailed it. Natural rights are negative rights. Positive rights, and and I only realized this a little while ago, positive rights, you know, the idea of negative rights is you have a right to be left alone by me. Mm -hmm. I have a right to be left alone by you. And mm-hmm. and if we look at that religiously, we have to be left alone. We can't be coerced because in order to save our souls, we have to function as self-controlling entities. Mm-hmm. Now, mm-hmm. the question is, even when you're being coerced, do you actually still have self-control? In the end, yes, you do. You can choose. You can let them shoot you. Mm-hmm. You know, right. a lot of Christian martyrs have done that. Mm-hmm. So we still have choice all the way to the end because it's not about our material being. It's about our souls. That's right. That's the choice we make about our souls. And, and that's, that's the point so that, that Solzhenitsyn made, you know, when he talked in his, yes. in his last essay, live not by lies. He said, you know, even yes. if, you know, out of, you know, self-preservation or cowardice or whatever you want to call it, even if you get to the point where, all right, I'll go along and I'll repeat what they have to say, but he goes, don't believe it. And even that little beginning of a pushback against this totalitarianism is a start, and it's a very important start that you understand that I'm just, you know, um, uh, giving them in a cowardly way. I'm giving them what they want, but I don't believe it. He said the thing you got to watch out for is um, <clears throat> that you come to believe these lies and to live by those lies as if they were true, and that was what Orwell focused on all the time as well. And this is one of the reasons why I try to educate myself and I try to get some of this information out to people because I think, unfortunately, with those generation upon generation of opportunists that we have, you have generation upon generation of normalcy bias where people don't realize that they're living by lies. They don't understand the difference between positive so-called rights, which is, and this is where positivism comes in. I didn't realize that positivism, uh, much like fiat currency, people are like, what is that, an Italian car? It's like, no, it's <laughs> government by order. It's it's money by government fiat. It's they the should have done that. Positive. They should have had a, a fiat currency. Yeah. That would have, <laughs> yeah. yeah. When they came up, they did the clone <laughs> of the Miata. They called it the fiat you know? <laughs> and they did yeah, their, yeah, yeah. They did their own engine, which is the thing that you don't want from the Italians. <laughs> It's exactly. The engine, you know, exactly. So That's failure. great. That's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Fiat and and it, it, yeah, and it's it's fascinating too. If you look at the history of the fa- uh, the the fascism coming from the fascists, and you know, really termed by Mussolini in 1925. As I mentioned in my video, if folks aren't familiar with the fascists, all they have to do is visit the Lincoln Memorial, and they'll get it. And then they might understand what fascism is if they don't understand that Lincoln Abraham Lincoln was a massive fascist. <laughs> yeah, that's um, right. Oh yeah, but, they merged the uh, the industries with the uh, the state in a lot of different ways, and especially absolutely. the Republican Party after the the war. You know the way they uh, allied themselves with the railroads, and and of course that's corruption. You know it, that's the yeah. other part of it. You know this this crony capitalism, this economic fascism, it is uh, total corruption. But uh, yeah, oh no, yeah, that, yeah. They, they should do that. They should come out. <laughs> <laughs> they should come out with a car and call it the fiat currency. They could even have the the fiat uh, fascista, right? Yeah, <laughs> I drive a fascista. It's a it's a big. <laughs> it's got, it comes as a bundle, you know, and then that would uh, be I great. I guess so. The, do, the fiat currency, you got to watch the tire inflation. Uh, it can get yeah, too absolutely, high, right? <laughs> absolutely. They could do old style black and white with subtitles underneath and Italian, you know, American English. But but it is it is interesting because. I think, you know, living living by lies, I think many people don't even understand that they're living by lies of the government. And this is where this this idea of positive rights comes in. I didn't even know until a few years ago when I started teaching philosophy and economics, I started digging around a little bit. I, I might have been writing something for the Mises Institute. And oh, it was Jeffrey Tucker. That's what it was. So you remember how um, you read that piece uh, from the Brownstone Inst- Institute mm-hmm. by Jeffrey mm-hmm. Tucker? Yeah. Uh, and he and he looked at uh, Jared Kushner's book and found all those parts that you started to put together and god bless jeffrey tucker so So he read it so we don't have to that's yeah yeah exactly (laughs) oh the torture the pain but uh 
So uh, you still have a choice, Jeffrey. But anyway, um, <laughs> the ventilators, the ventilator. King. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes. 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 And the fact that they knew and they were so corrupt. Um, but um, Jeffrey used to edit over at the Mises Institute. And I wrote a very long piece about John Locke and how people have to be very wary of John Locke's concept, because as a libertarian anarchist, it was when I realized that there's a tautology within John Locke's concept. Um, where he actually is a positivist. And, and so positivism is the idea that rights are posited by the state. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know that. I didn't realize that. And I, I, I think Jeffrey sort of tipped me off when I started to do some research. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's, that's just yeah. a privilege. You know, if the state gives it to you, it's a privilege. It's not, it's not, it's exactly. not a right if it's, it's not, not natural, right. if it's not from God, yeah. it's not a right. Yeah. And in order, and in order for the state to give it to you, it has to take it from someone else. And this is the problem with Locke. And, you know, it's not I'm not trying to advocate for anarchism or anything like that. It's more just a conversational uh, point. Uh, but it leads to so many problems, which is, you know, Locke uh, agreed that you, you have a right to be left alone by me. I have a right to be left alone by you. And he says out of the state of nature, men agree to form a government to protect their natural rights, as Jefferson said in the Declaration, the right to life, liberty. And he was originally going to put property in there, but he put pursuit of happiness because that also represents free market exchange mm -hmm. to pursue your happiness and, and religious freedom, things like that. So um, the problem is that Locke already assumes for other people that they have to form a state to protect their their property from others mm -hmm. but the state now claims the power to take their property from them in order to protect them <laughs> so he's just created a giant protection racket yeah that's, and that's so, government. and that's <laughs> yes that's exactly what and is, from, yeah. exactly and that that unfortunately is the camel's tent and that's why i i you know i i look at historical periods like uh, ancient ireland and uh and their decentralized tribe based you know and people say well that's not workable now but but uh you look at ancient ireland they had this thing called the brehan law and it was basically free market uh there was no state there was no taxation it was all done locally with chieftains and that's where the concept of kings came from around that area they had a similar thing in ancient england uh you can see it particularly around cornwall and in the midlands and then they also had a similar thing up in viking age iceland uh, which uh, Milton Friedman's son, David Friedman, wrote about in his book, Machinery of Freedom. And that was called the Goddard system. I have a friend named Dennis Goddard. And the Goddard was the temple where you could go for your disputes and everybody had a bundle of rights. <laughs> We're talking about bundles with the Pashis. <laughs> in this case, it was a lot better. Um, and that lasted for about a thousand years until they had to move away because, of course, global warming, no, global cooling yeah. got them. <laughs> and uh, they couldn't raise crops there in Iceland anymore. So I look at these examples and I say, OK, as long as I can remind people about where some of these things happened, then we're no longer living by lies. We no longer have this artifice in front of us. We can recognize where the TSA comes from, mm -hmm. the opportunists from the United States Postal Service, the opportunists with Alexander Hamilton uh, trying to install a central bank and to utilize the excise tax in order to strengthen the central government. We can see how people like Mark Houck today being attacked by the FBI. Mm -hmm. um, if, we, if we go back to the creation of the FBI, we go back to the Secret Service, which was started in the 1800s, originally in the Treasury Department. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we see how these things metastasize. We see different presidents use them and they pull levers and they are able to aggrandize power unto themselves. So, um, you know, I look at, uh, to go back to the Italian thing, I look at that as a, a, as a wonderful change where I might disagree with this woman, but I see these opposing sides. And I, I bring up a little difference, and I hope people don't up, uh, get upset, where I say, let's learn a little something here so that we don't make these mistakes anymore. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we have to take the best uh, from whoever we can and, and leave behind the bad stuff. And, and yeah. so, you know, the, the simple fact of the matter is, is that the Italian people are pushing back against this centralized control. They're pushing back against the attacks on uh, family, on God, on country, on themselves. That, that's what we've seen in all the pandemic lockdown stuff. And she was better at pushing back against this kind of stuff and uh, against this uh, imposition 
of central control than any of the other parties, and that's what the people wanted. We don't have, unfortunately, we don't have anybody uh, in this country that is standing up to this stuff. I mean, the, this weak uh, commitment to America is just pablum. It's nothing but generalities. It's no specifics, and they completely ignore all the fundamental issues uh, that are before us. is is really awful uh, to see what it is. Yeah. But uh, before yeah. we run out of time, I want to talk about your newest article uh, that you have. Uh, is it on Substack about the McDonald's uh, lawsuit? Is that oh, on? I'm going to be working on that one. I'm so glad you brought that up with yeah. Byron Allen from yeah. the, from the old NBC TV show Real People. Yeah, let's uh, talk that about is, that. What's going on with that? That's something I hadn't seen. You you found that. Talk oh, yeah. about that. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know whether MRC TV will have me work on this. I have to pitch this to them. Uh, but uh, I saw this yesterday, and it's a piece about Byron Allen, who is a multimedia mogul. Uh, he owns the Weather Channel now, I believe. He He's he's multi, multi, multi-millionaire. And um, uh, he has brought, I believe it's a $10 billion lawsuit against McDonald's Corporation. Because he says that they are not allowing African American based corporations to advertise, or they are not advertising enough with African American based media outlets. Hmm. So, and this this actually was something I wanted to bring up when I was talking about, um, you know, John Locke and things like that. Because if you go by ancient tradition, if you look at tort law, right? As I mentioned in my email to you, um, and I posted this on Facebook. Um, you know, tort law originally was person on person, right? Mm -hmm. You had to show a personal injury in court, and then you could bring a tortious claim against someone. It goes by British common law. And this was something for local communities in the face of others. You would have it in front of a jury within the community, and you could say, yes, I've been harmed. And then you could go to court to find out what you would be paid in damages. So now I had no idea that deciding not to do business with someone was a tortious <laughs> act and this goes towards as i mentioned in my email this goes towards the 1964 public accommodations portion of the 1964 civil rights act it goes towards the americans with disabilities act under george hw bush in the 1990s all of these things where they infringe on the right to free association so byron allen is suing mcdonald's because they aren't as he claims and it's, it's $10 billion, this wow. lawsuit. Wow. So he's claiming that they are not advertising comparably with African-American-owned media outlets. Hmm. Well, you now, know, imagine. I, when, yeah. when you look at that, uh, you know, it, it's um, one could say the same thing about uh, the social media censors and about YouTube. They've decided they don't want to do business with me, for example. And, and but I, I, you know, the difference here is that McDonald's is not the public square, you know? And that's what I think, uh, you know, you have lady was in the public chapter from handing out religious Supreme court and won the Supreme court owned. You can't square and Media have said this is the whole idea behind Section 230 was that it was a PO as well as Democrats are out there telling you're going to censor who I want you to censor, right? So, so we know that these people are doing this at the bidding of government. That they're simply, you know, uh, plausible deniability for government censorship. Uh, but as uh, you look at the history of these types of free speech lawsuits, a lot of people have, I think, muddied the water by saying, well. There have been lawsuits where people want to hand out stuff in a mall, and they said, no, you don't have the right to hand out anything in the mall. And I said, yeah, but that's not a public square. That's a place of business. Uh, even in the common areas, they rent out kiosks and all the rest of this stuff. So everything there in the mall, you no more expect that you could go in and do whatever you wanted to, handing out stuff inside Sears if they still existed, which I guess they don't. But you can go into Sears and, and hand out uh, flyers and everything you would expect. No, that's their property. They can, they can kick you out. And, and so I, I think that's where you draw the line. But as you're pointing out, this is like saying, well, no, we're going to um, uh, make Sears uh, allow you to do that. I think that's drawing the line in the wrong place. I think we need to understand the difference between public squares and public accommodation 
and uh, between and, and then respect uh, uh, private property and what people can do there. What, what do you think about? Yeah, that? David, this is one of the areas where it's it's really incredibly fruitful conversation with you, as you say, public square versus public accommodations. And and this is I have a slightly different take on this than you do, um, because to me, there's there's a stark difference. There's always got to be a market. And I know we're running up against the clock, but there's there. I would love to talk to you about this more uh, to sort of uh, elucidate your your ideas and my ideas, because we we come together when it comes to corporate, the creation of corporations by the state. But mm-hmm. I think we slightly differ in that um, I look at what is public, that which is that which uses taxpayer money is public. There's a stark difference. Anything that is started with a private investment, and and again, it it gets blurry when it starts to be corporations, Mm -hmm. but anything that is started with a private investment, which includes malls and also in the Marsh v. Alabama case, includes that campus where they created that town. That's private investment. And just because the government calls it the public square, or that someone calls it the public square doesn't make it public. Taxpayer money isn't being used on that. So other people, the only way you can have private property control is to, uh, the only way you can have a concept of private property is if the person who spent the money on it or agreed to use it is given power over it. If the state is involved, it's no longer private property, it becomes public property. But it remains private property if the state has not spent money on it. Mm-hmm. And this is the problem. So the, the distinction that I would draw here with the Marsh v. Alabama case is even though the government says it's the public square, that doesn't make it the public square. I understand. And even I think open, maybe what they were looking at was the fact that the because it was a town, and it was where people were living, that the uh, corporation had assumed essentially uh, a government like powers. OK, and we've got a lot of governments everywhere that are incorporated. <laughs> so yeah, if we're going yeah, yeah. to give anything that's uh, got a corporation uh, and a corporation articles uh, passed to do whatever they want, we're in big trouble. So I think maybe what they were looking at, and, and I don't know, I haven't read the um, decision to that degree to see why, how they argued uh, for it. Uh, but um, perhaps that would be an argument for freedom. Uh, I, I just look at it and I, I think that the, um, you know, it, it's not an, it's not an injury, uh, to that, uh, company to allow people to have free speech there. One of the reasons why I would well, support it. Well, see, but this is, this is where I might disagree with you because it's, it's you defining for them that it's not an injury. Mm-hmm. They, they have the right to define for themselves what they want or don't want in that area. And, and it's their money. They invested it. And the people who go to live there go on certain agreements. I think the problem arises is if, and this is where people who deal with corporate law, if these people have approached the government to say, we would like to incorporate, then the question for me in an abstract, in an abstract way arises, can the government set parameters saying, well, if you're going to incorporate, you have to allow us to tell you to do this or that. That gets into things like the Grove City College decision for the Supreme Court, where they have things like unconstitutional conditions, where, for example, Grove City College said, we are not going to have Title IX. Mm-hmm. And then the, the federal government said, well, you, if you're taking federal money, you have to abide by this. And they said, no, that's an unconstitutional condition. Uh, they had a, a case, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit, they had a case called the um, um, uh, Cabrini Green case. Mm -hmm. where it was a federal housing unit. And they said, if you want to live here, you have to allow for no knock in searches inside because a child was killed in a drug deal out in the parking lot. This is a title, a section eight housing. If you're going to take the housing, you have to accept no knock fourth amendment abridging invasions of your privacy. The Supreme court found against that. They said that is an unconstitutional condition. You can't say that you are going to give up a federally protected right under the constitution uh, for a federal uh, benefit of, of housing. So in this case, if you're asking for a federal benefit for corporate status, I would think that the unconstitutional condition standard would apply to mm-hmm. say, well, if you're asking for corporate status, the federal government can't demand that you give up your rights to your property, your fourth amendment rights and things like this. Yeah, and that's this a very where, good point. I, we're almost out yeah. of time. I just want to say, you know, when we look at it, when you look at uh, what's happening on social media, uh, the Section 230 
is there as a condition to say, well, you're not going to control content. Therefore, we're not going to come after you. And yet they have that immunity, but they have violated the other part of it and they are editing content. And, and so yes. I think uh, there is a very, it's, it's even clearer than, than the other issues that they had that as a condition that they would not edit it. And yet they have violated that condition. I just see that the Republicans are coming at it the wrong way. They want to get rid of Section yes. 230. I think what we need to do is enforce Section 230. Uh, but they want to be able to censor people, and and that's uh, and they want to use these these corporations as their beard. We're nearly out of time. I want you to give people uh, again. Tell them where they can find you on Substack and on um, the uh, Liberty Hangout. Uh, I'm sorry. Not, uh, well, you tell them. <laughs> It's, oh yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, oh sure. Uh, yeah. So oh, I'm uh, at Substack. It's Gardner Goldsmith, mm -hmm. and uh, on Amazon, I got to mention my fiction. On Amazon, I have three novellas that are out there. Just look up Gardner Goldsmith, and you'll find my novellas out there. So Substack for nonfiction on my own, MRCTV.org for the work I do for MRCTV, and uh, Liberty Conspiracy YouTube Liberty channel Conspiracy. is yes, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Now the Liberty Conspiracy website does exist but we have to update it and uh, so just look at BitChute, odyssey and rumble we'd love to see more people at liberty conspiracy channels over there that'd be great yeah and and folks we've updated our website the david knight uh please give us feedback as to uh, uh things that you don't like about it. if you like it you can tell us too but <laughs> if there's something that you really don't like about it uh let us know we're starting to get some feedback and we changed the website so we could offer some merchandise and um, you see the cups here. I've got the T-shirt here that you've seen in the back. It's got a left chest logo. And on the back, it has the David Knight Show. So uh, all be, of that is I'll available. I'll be wearing mine. <laughs> okay, great. great. Thanks, Guard. Yeah, Guard was one of the first people to order anything. So I appreciate that, Guard. Thank you. Uh, that's it for today's broadcast. Thank you for joining us. And thank you, Guard. Great talking to you, as always. You too, David. Love common man. They created common core to dumb down our children. They created common past to track and control us. Their commons project to make sure the commoners own nothing and the communist future. They see the common man as simple, unsophisticated, ordinary. But each of us has worth and dignity created in the image of God. That is what we have in common. That is what they want to take away. Their most powerful weapons are isolation, deception, intimidation. They desire to know everything about us while they hide everything from us. It's time to turn that around and expose what they want to hide. Please share the information and links you'll find at thedavidnightshow.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. If you can't support us financially, please keep us in your prayers. TheDavidKnightShow.com